Hey guys, quick shout out to AeroPress. They're sponsoring today's video. Check out the promo and hit the link in our description to get 15% off an AeroPress for yourself. This is the new 2024 Porsche Cayenne. And if it doesn't look all that new, that's because this is the mid-cycle refresh. For most automakers, the mid-cycle refresh is a way to refine a car's looks, crank up the power a little bit, and address complaints that customers may have had with the original, or make adjustments for new regulations. In general, the mid-cycle refresh improves the car. And with some cars, uh, those improvements are drastic to the point where you almost never want to buy the first-gen car. Like Lamborghini, for instance, who only ever seemed to get it right the second or third time around. Think Mercy, Gallardo, Huracan, and Aventador, all of which became vastly superior products post-refresh. Back to Porsches, it's really the modern 911's mid-cycle refresh that gets headlines. With the 997 in 2009, you got PDK, a significantly updated interior, and an engine that was much less likely to blow up. For the 991 generation, you got turbocharged engines across the board and the return of the stick shift in the GT3. But occasionally, an update can make the car worse. Today we're on the mountain to find out if Porsche has succeeded or failed in updating the Cayenne. Because we are the smoking tire, we are in the comically fast $200,000 Nürburgring spec turbo GT variant. It makes 19 more horsepower than before for a total of 650 and 626 pound-feet of torque. So it now accelerates from valet stand to 60 miles per hour in just 3.1 seconds runs the quarter mile in 11.6. That's quicker than a 911 GT3 from 10 years ago. Even though this Cayenne weighs as much as a GT3 with a Porsche 914 on the roof. It will do 189 miles per hour, which Porsche says is its top track speed. But there's no GPS limitation on this car. Now, if we had a runway, I would test this out to see if it would actually stop at 189 miles per hour. But we don't because today we're in the mountains. So instead, we're gonna test this. Folks, I cannot tell you how nice it is to be sponsored today by a product and a company that I love so much. I first discovered the AeroPress in Panama at the Baja Reque Coffee House where they were using it in a professional grade coffee shop to brew the Esmeralda Geisha, which was the most expensive and delicious, rarest coffee in the world. And we decided then and there that if it was good enough for this coffee in this environment, that it was good enough for home. And so we brought them home and we've been using them ever since. Now I've got a coffee pot, I've got a pod machine, you name it, but the AeroPress does it. It's portable, it's light, it's virtually indestructible, and it's versatile, and you can use it to make almost anything. The three-in-one process is what makes the AeroPress so different. It's about immersion. You put your fine grounds in here and you fully immerse it in water, right? I'm gonna make an American coffee right now. You got your foam, you stir it. That's the aeration. Get those nice and stirred up, and then you add just a little bit more water as your foam head settles a bit. And in just about one minute, step three, the pressure. By using this plunger with the seal, you force the flavor from those coffee grinds into the water while simultaneously cleaning the inside of the barrel on the way into your cup. You just slowly press it down like this through the paper filter at the bottom or the metal filter if you get that option and creating a not bitter, perfectly flavored delicious coffee, latte, or espresso every time. When it comes time to clean up, you pop off the cap and pop this straight into the trash. Super easy, throw it in the dishwasher, it's good to go. And now it's totally clear. The old model, which I still have, is gray. It's cool, it's lovely, but this, 
This is something you can display on your countertop. It looks professional and it works professional. I probably could have done a little bit cleaner job, but I don't usually narrate while making coffee. You'll have to forgive me. Hit the link in today's video description. Get the AeroPress clear for yourself. It's all new, makes a great gift, and it will last a lifetime. And thanks to AeroPress for sponsoring today's video. I'm not sure where the cross section is of a person who needs an SUV that only holds four people, that holds less luggage than a traditionally shaped SUV, but also runs a Nurburgring lap time that's quicker than a McLaren 650S or a Nissan GTR or a Lexus LFA. But here we are. And if anyone is going to find a niche market for expensive sporty vehicles, it is Porsche. BMW finds all the niche markets at the lower end. You know, someone who wants a coupe that's a sedan and a sedan coupe that's front wheel drive that used to be rear wheel drive and maybe something that kind of looks like a sedan but is also lifted and then 15 different SUVs all under $100,000. That's BMW's job. Porsche will make 82 different cars that can go really, really fast, handle great and somehow feel natural doing it even though many of them seem like they don't belong there. Oh my God. The handling is ridiculous. I'll tell you what, two years ago when we drove this, I was mind blown by the handling. And today, same thing. Haven't driven one since, but equally shocked, equally blown away. What I love is that you can adjust the chassis separately from the powertrain. We've got the powertrain in Sport Plus. We've got the shocks in Sport. The suspension is just incredible. They've changed the air suspension. They've gone from a single chamber with three modes to a two chamber with two modes. So one times three is less than two times two, yeah? So now what it's done is effectively is spread out the effective usage. The sport is a little sportier. The comfort is a little more comfortable. And in between, you have a little more precise control of the chassis. And although the wheels and tires are the same size as before, there is a new Pirelli compound that does give you somehow even more grip. And combined with that unbelievable amount of front negative camber, probably the most of any SUV in history, the turn-in is just ridiculous. The, the turn-in doesn't make sense, and the agility does not make sense. Given the weight of this thing, given the size of it, I mean, it turns in so quickly. On some cars with air suspension, you can feel it moving the mass around mid-corner. Anything but the best is not great for high-speed dynamic driving, but this is very good, very good. I am completely unaware that I am on air springs in this, completely. And then there's the brakes. The carbon ceramic brakes are bigger than the wheels on my Italian cars. Bigger than the wheels. They're 17 inches. Combined with the amount of rubber and the compound of rubber they have, it is just incredible. Then there's the rear steer. Rear steer is how you make a 5,000 plus pound SUV feel much smaller and more agile, right? But they've reprogrammed it. It's smarter now. And something that it can do is it knows how, not just how much steering input you're putting in, but how hard and aggressively you're doing it. And the effective result is when you turn in gently, it turns the rear gently. When you turn in hard, 
it turns the rear hard and it can adjust that so to give you almost a sensation of drifting the corner or backing it in it's not so much that it's disconcerting but you know something is going on there to help you out and it's pretty crazy i'm going to make a u-turn here and show you that the rear steer well okay it doesn't shrink it that much oh so fast but really it's the way this thing shifts it shifts so quickly it's not imperceptible you feel it and hear it a little bit but it is near instant near instant doesn't upset the car at all that's ferocious that is ferocious <laughs> Uh, I don't know why the image that comes to mind is Tyrannosaurus Rex that got on a Hayabusa. Like, that, the exhaust note is the T-Rex getting scared out of its mind as it launches to 60 miles per hour in 3.1 seconds. It's just ridiculous. But what Porsche wants us talking about is the interior. They say it's one of the most extensive mid-cycle refreshes in the history of the company. They call it Porsche Driver Experience. According to them, it provides a more engaging drive even though in reality it means screens, lots more screens, curved screens, touch screens, and buttons that look like screens. At the lower end, screens are good. They make a cheaper car feel more premium. They give it more features. It's a little bit simpler. Screens can help provide functionality to lower end cars without having to add physical buttons for stuff, returning good value for money. But at the high end, it's a different story. Screenification has to be done right, otherwise the experience will suffer. The new interior will be familiar to anyone who's driven a Taycan or seen our videos with the electric sedan. That cockpit has now trickled down into the Cayenne. The electric shaver shift lever is on the dash like the Taycan. The gauge cluster is now a hoodless curved screen like the Taycan. The steering wheel comes from the 992 Carrera and important controls have been focused around it. The whole thing is highly digitized. And let's be honest, digitized and engaging driving experience intersect each other about as often as 5,000 pound SUV interacts with sub eight minute ring time. The interior looks cool, no doubt. It's futuristic, but does any of this stuff actually improve the driving experience? I don't think that they have gone too far with the digital displays here, mainly because it's not about the display itself, but about the buttons. You don't want the main things that you need all the time to be in a touch screen or a touch panel. Those have toggles, those have scrolly wheels, and I am okay with that. The curved screen with no binnacle, that's pretty cool. What's really impressive about that is that no matter where the sun is coming from, it doesn't really glare. That's pretty innovative. And then you've got the shifter on the dash, which actually in an automatic car is fine. It cleans up this center console, allowing you to have it for other things. But what really does work is the, just it's just a little bit, right? The things that must be physical knobs and buttons are. You have a volume scrolling knob, very important. And then you've got some hard toggle switches for your basic climate control functions, also very important. Those are things that you're adjusting constantly while driving, possibly even while driving at speed. And you don't want those things to be settings that you have to take your eye off the road for and find a haptic button, right? It works, it's actually a pretty good balance. All the uh, secondary stuff, the GPS, the secondary settings of the car, you know, the drive modes are here on a scrolly wheel, on the steering wheel. So the primary functions that you're going to be adjusting all the time are through buttons, and everything else is through a touchscreen. And that's okay. Now one new thing they've done in the interior is made a cooled wireless charging place for your iPhone. 
Now that is good because I've had this experience with a lot of wireless chargers where the phone would overheat and shut down or it charged really slowly. Now because it's a cooled compartment, they can charge at a rate of 15 watts, which is only three shy of the Apple iPhone USB-C charger. That's pretty fast. However, I still prefer a wired charger because if you hit a bump and the phone moves out of place just slightly, it stops charging. And in this car, with the Nürburgring lap time record suspension, you're gonna feel that bump. And you do, even in normal mode. It's not that the suspension is bad, it's just firm. And if you're gonna set lap time records, you can't have tempur soft springs. But there, see those shutters going over these little bumps? That iPhone is not in place anymore. The charging has stopped. Porsche has introduced the passenger touchscreen display, which allows the person sitting shotgun to play DJ, set the navigation, and control other secondary functions from the right seat, because reaching to the middle of the car would be ridiculous. They can even stream content directly to the screen over 5G, with a vision blocker so that the driver can't see it. Like an in-flight entertainment system, except there may be some side effects. You ever look at your phone or an iPad too long on a windy road? I wonder if it's got like a vomit resistant coating of some kind. Now, the fact that our tester is the Turbo GT means it's very fast and it's the highest performant version of the Cayenne they make. So obviously some things will be left out. There's no sunroof and the roof is carbon fiber. There's no center back seat. This one is only a four seater, so you get better kind of lateral bolstering in the back. And it has the stupid coupe body, which I hate. But Porsche has just extended that coupe body to the entire Cayenne line, because would you believe the take rate on that is 30%? 30% of their customers have said, yes, I want my SUV to be less practical because apparently it's not okay to have either a coupe or an SUV. You must have both. Porsche has added standard equipment to the new model year, and some of that used to be optional. So the base price is higher, but in effect, you're getting kind of the same or a little more for your money. But this thing still doesn't have cooled seats, and it still doesn't have an adjustable lumbar. Now, I'm not saying the seat isn't comfortable. It is, but it's hot and I've got a bad back. And for 200 grand, let's remember that this is first and foremost a luxury car and a performance car second. The question I was asking myself the last time we drove the Turbo GT is who is this car for? Who wants a lifted super track car that seats four people and you could take to uh, uh, on a ski trip as long as you had a different set of wheels and put good tires on it for the winter. Well, there are people that don't want to or can't own multiple cars. Not everyone has enough space to own a 911 and a truck and an SUV or a minivan and a sports car, whatever. If you want a car that does everything and that can bring your friends and family wherever you need to go while also giving you the fizz, Incredibly enough, in this day and age, there is a car with air suspension and four seats that does exactly that. It doesn't just advertise it, it delivers. And that is what is so impressive and surprising. Although I have trouble getting over the fact that a SUV designed to drive like a sports car is kinda dumb, I can't argue with what's in front of me. This thing drives awesome. It goes, it stops, it turns, it rides like an AMG S-Class, and it fits all your stuff. So I don't really understand everything about the customer that wants this thing. I go home finding I kind of want one myself. And remember, always fight your tickets. Use code TST10 on the Off the Record app available in the Android and iOS store or go to offtherecord.com slash TST.